everyone. Welcome to our study on the parables of Jesus. This is the parable of the sower part one and we're going to be looking at how to understand the parables of Jesus uh, with perhaps the most important parable of all. Again the parable of the sower and that is we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, uh, Matthew chapter 13, <coughs> excuse me, and then Luke chapter 8. All three synoptic gospel writers record the parable of the sower. The fact that they all record it is extremely important in and of itself. Jesus, uh, one third, at least one third of all of Jesus' teaching was given in parables. And given that much teaching, we want to understand, we, we want to appreciate how important the parables are, but we also want to understand how to interpret those parables. And that's what this focus is all about. Uh, we're going to go in depth into teaching on the parables and um, what we want to do right now is we want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come and lead and guide us into all of his truth. So you join me in prayer now as we call upon the Lord. And Father, we do call upon you now and we ask that you would move greatly upon us we invite you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. And in Luo, in Kenya, that is, be rojo maler. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit, and open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, so that your word uh, changes us and transforms us to become more like you, Lord Jesus. We look to you now uh, for that work, Holy Spirit, that only you can accomplish in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you turn with me to Mark chapter 4, I also want to greet everyone here that is watching by video and uh, just remind you that all the teaching is for everyone, but there also is a specific focus in uh, my ministry in training up, teaching, training, and mentoring uh, pastors and church leaders in Siaya, Kenya. We're uh, Danny Gilbert and I are starting a, a Bible Institute and <clears throat> and this this whole teaching on the parables of Jesus is just one course in that Bible Institute uh, in order to, to help our our brothers and sisters in Kenya receive the very best teaching that they can get and certainly that they deserve as well and so that's what this focus is about I'm teaching in the morning. I know it's probably late in the evening. Well, it wouldn't be late in the evening there. It probably is in the morning that you're watching this video. So I just want to say in Luo uh, to those Kenyans, Oya ore ahinya. That is good morning. Misawa ahinya is, a, is just a, a greeting uh, to them, a, a kind of a blessing greeting. And uh, let me just say Opak Ruoth. And Opaki Yesu, Nyasai Ber, Nyasai Duong. So I've just given glory uh, to God in, uh, in Luo. Well, Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Mark chapter 4, I hope your Bibles are open to Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And he began to teach again by the sea. This would be the Sea of Galilee, and he's most likely in his home base of Capernaum. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that he, be, that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. Now for us, we might think, well, how in the world could he sit in a boat and teach a large multitude? But actually, studies have been done in that area of the Sea of Galilee, and the acoustics are spectacular so that I could speak at this volume that I'm speaking at now from a boat on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and about more than 5,000 people could hear me. Uh, so just in God's providence, the, the acoustics in that area are remarkable. And I just wanted to share that with you. That is not in your notes. Uh, but nevertheless, it's important for us to understand um, the historical context of scripture and how how accurate it really is well in verse 2 and he was teaching them watch this many things 
in parables and was saying to them in his teaching. So now what Mark is going to do is he's going to focus on one of those parables. Indeed, this is probably the most important parable <coughs> of all. Excuse me. He says, listen, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. Verse 4, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Verse 5, other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. Verse 6, and after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded uh, no crop. It yielded no crop. <clears throat> Let me read that again. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Hear that. It yielded no crop. I'm repeating that for myself. It yielded no crop. Well, let's move on to verse 8. Other seed fell into the good soil. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's 3,000%, 6,000%, and 10,000% compared to verse 7 where because the thorns choked choked this growing seed it yielded no crop that's that is a massive contrast isn't it verse 9 and he was saying he who has ears to hear let him hear Verse 10, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, verse 11, to you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now, notice that he didn't say anything about the kingdom in the parable itself, that is in verses 1 through 8. He said he never mentioned the word kingdom, but to the disciples who come to him for an explanation, he says, to you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Mystery in the New Testament is something that used to be hidden, but is now revealed. That gives you an insight, gives us an insight into the heart of God that he wants to reveal that which was hidden. Verse 11 again. And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So Mark tells us early in earlier in verse 2 that he spoke many things to them in parables. Now he says to the disciples, they those who are outside get everything in parables. So that, verse 12, while seeing, they may not see and perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Now, the question that we have that's obvious to us is, is God intentionally holding back the riches of his truths from these people? Is he intentionally doing it? Or is there something else here that we need to understand? But then he speaks directly to the disciples in verse 13, and he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? How will you understand all the parables? That is a direct question and certainly to us, there is a clear sense of urgency, isn't there, for us to understand the parable of the sower. Do you not understand this parable? If you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all the parables? And remember, 
one-third of all of his teaching is in parables. I'm glad you're watching this and that you're relying on the Holy Spirit to teach you uh, because clearly this, the par understanding the parables of Jesus is vital to our faith, isn't it? But for those of you who are in Kenya who are uh, called to teach and preach, you're called to teach and preach the parables just like anything else in Scripture. Obviously, we have to understand what we're teaching and preaching on um, ourselves before we can teach it. But the people of God need to hear and learn this parable, don't they? Well, let me go to your notes now in um, under the section, The Parable of the Sower, Part 1. The subtitle is In-Depth Teaching on the Parable of the Sower. And that brings us immediately to paragraph A. And uh, in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, William Lane helps set the stage for us in securing the best understanding of the parable when he notes that Mark has Jesus warning the hearers to pay close attention at the beginning and at the end of the parable. At the beginning of the parable, and that blank there is, and at the end of the parable. Well, let's look at that again uh, in verse 3. He says, listen to this. In Greek, that is a present active imperative. That is, it's a command. Jesus is not suggesting that they listen to this. He is commanding that they listen to it. And the verb is in the present tense. In other words, he's saying, listen, that is here with the intent to obey. That's really what this is all about. Listen or hear and continue to listen and hear. But did the multitudes continue to listen in here? I don't think they did. Now, paragraph number three, I mean, that's that's verse number three. And then notice in verse nine, and he was saying, that's in the imperfect tense. It means he said it more than once. Hence the sense of urgency. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Obviously, that's a figure of speech. Um, he's not focusing on the physical aspect. He's focusing on the heart aspect of hearing his message. Well, that brings me to, to um, paragraph number two in your notes. A farmer in that land walked along a very narrow path with a pouch of seed at his side. He put his, hands, uh, his hand in the pouch and he would spread the seed upon both sides of the path into the cultivated earth. Now, it should be noted that in many parts of Israel, land was and remains full of rocks and stones. I've been to Israel. I've led three trips to Israel now. And that is, even though we're, we're in, uh, the, the first trip I led was 1999. The next one was 2010. And the third one was 2014. And uh, I can tell you that as developed as that land is, there are rocks everywhere. It's, it's funny. Now, paragraph three, it's interesting that farmers in the land of Israel then and apparently still would sow their seed first and then plow afterward, which is a little bit countercultural to what we do, at least in the United States. I don't know how you all farm in Kenya. But one of my favorite commentators, Leon Morris, in his commentary on Luke, notes that he personally witnessed this very action in uh, the land of Israel in 1952. Now, paragraph 4 in your notes, in addition, regarding verse 7 and the action of the thorns sprouting quickly and choking out the wheat, Morris notes that Thorns were plants of vigorous growth and would grow faster than the wheat. Isn't that interesting? The thorns would grow faster than the wheat. Well, of course, the people that he spoke to understood this. That leads me to paragraph number five in your notes. Sometimes biblical teachers, including Jesus, would use hyperbole to make a deeper point. 
Hyperbole is, is a word that means exaggeration to make a, deep, a deeper point. However, many expositors, um, for example, Robertson, A.T. Robertson, have shown that it is actually entirely possible in many lands to have the kind of harvest that Jesus spoke of, 30, 60, and 100 fold. That is 3,000%, 6,000%, and 10,000%. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by 30, 60, and 100 fold? We'll, we'll talk about that, of course, in depth later. Paragraph number six in your notes in verse nine, I've already mentioned this, a hundredfold return would equal 10,000%, 60-fold would equal 6,000% return in this crop, or development or growth in this crop, and 30-fold would be a 3,000% return. And herein lay the spiritual clue, that blank there in paragraph number six, herein lay the spiritual clue to the parable and one that should have caused the listeners to want to understand it. Again, remember now, in verse seven, Jesus says "There's it yielded no crop. And then in verse eight, this crop yield is extraordinary. It's just absolutely fantastic. Now remember, this is a agricultural culture, the historical context of which Jesus was speaking in. It's important to keep that in mind. These were largely farmers. Yes, they were merchants. Yes, they were fishermen. But for the most part, they were farmers. You didn't have grocery stores that you could go buy your groceries. You didn't have canned items that you could put on a shelf. They had to grow their own fruit and vegetables. Uh, you know, all those things. So they had to farm of necessity. They understood what he was saying. That leads me to paragraph number seven. Still, as important as the idea of the yield of the seed may be, especially to a believer, um, R.T. Francis' point is well taken. He writes, The point of the parable does not lie in the size of the yield, but in the variety of the fate of the seed. Paragraph 8, that is, the response to the preaching of the Word of God is what is primary in Jesus' mind. The sower went out to sow. And then he explains in four different categories the kind of soil that the seed falls into. Remember, parables usually have one primary meaning. They may have a secondary meaning, but they're usually focused on one, one main point. So what is secondary is the result of how carefully one hears and obeys the word of God. However, we can certainly see in the comparisons that both are important to God. So it's not an either or, this is a both and. It leads me to paragraph number nine in your notes. Hence, there are two key points in the parable that should be obvious to the reader, but again, they're, they're primary and secondary points. Paragraph number 10 in your notes, the phrase Jesus uses in verse 9 is a strong exhortation to seek to understand the parable. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As a matter of fact, we can see the importance of that phrase with its critical sevenfold usage to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Seven times. Um, in this particular case, uh, it says, uh, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so you've got God the Son who is speaking his word, and then you've got God the Holy Spirit who is speaking his word as well. Now, let's go to paragraph number 11 in your notes, the idea behind the word hear in the Hebrew mindset. Remember now, these are Jews. In the Hebrew mindset, lay in the meaning of the Hebrew word Shema, which you find primarily, um, well, you find all throughout the Old Testament, but uh, the Shema, something called the Shema, is, is the Jewish uh, creed that is said even today. It was said 3,000 years ago, and it's been said 
almost on a daily basis by God-fearing Jews, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That's the Hebrew for Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then he goes on, Moses does, uh, to give a greater, uh, many more verses on this, on this creed. But Shema uh, means to hear with the intent to obey. Hear with the intent to obey and even pay attention to this. You know, when I was a little kid in school, uh, my my favorite teacher used to say to me, Brad, you're not hearing what I'm saying to you. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. In other words, you hear the words, but they're not going in, right? We, we say that all the time today. But the Hebrew mindset is when this, when it has anything to do with God and his word, our hearts should be ready to hear with the intent to obey. Now, the hearers, the, the large crowd, they knew that. They understood that. Keep that in mind. Paragraph number 12, this is what Jesus means, and it's also how the hearers would have taken his exhortation, though they still largely failed in their response to him. Well, with that, let's... let's um, what I want you to do now is, is hold your place in Mark chapter 4, and now I want to go back to Matthew 13 and look at, uh, as we move on in the notes to section B, the letter B, let's look at Matthew chapter 13, and we want to look at verses 10 through 15. Now, the reason why, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be going back and forth between the parable of the sower in Mark 4, in Matthew 13, and to a much lesser extent in Luke 8. They're, they're almost identical. However, each account of that parable in those three Gospels has, has some words that don't appear in the other ones. We, so we want to glean as much as we can from that. So let's look at Matthew chapter 13 and verses 10 through 15. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Isn't that interesting? There was something that bothered them about Jesus speaking to them in parables. Think about it. Only the disciples come to him for an explanation. The crowd doesn't come. The disciples, like we would understand, if you're going to preach to a crowd, you want to get the, the largest crowd possible. You don't want to weed them out, do you? And, and you want them to follow you, so why make it difficult for them to follow you? Or was Jesus really making it difficult for them to follow him? So they asked the question, why do you speak to them in parables? I'm laughing because you have to, we have to really be careful when we're about ready to ask God a question. Um, and it's not a question, you know, this, this has the tone of being a little indignant, doesn't it? I don't think they're asking the question like, Lord, uh, we don't quite get this. Could you help us to understand? I think the tone of the question was, we don't agree with you doing this, so we're going to pose this in a question. And Jesus answered them in verse 11, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Verse 12, For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Now, to 21st century Americans, i got to tell you, most Americans would say, well, that's not fair. Jesus isn't being fair to these people. That's the kind of the American mentality. But is that really the case? Verse 13, Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Here's this answer. Because while seeing, they don't see. And while hearing, they do not hear. The evidence was right in front of them. He spoke the parables and they walked away. 
while hearing they do not hear nor do they understand in this in their case the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled which says you will keep on hearing but you will not understand and you will keep on seeing but will not perceive what were they seeing they were seeing the Messiah in their very midst and walking away and not asking him for an interpretation of the parable you will keep on seeing but will not perceive for here's the note of explanation back to uh, the disciples asking the question why do you speak to them in parables Jesus is giving them the explanation and it's highlighted with that word for which is a a connective denoting purpose or reason or result for the heart of this people has become dull with their eyes I mean with their ears they scarcely hear and they have closed their eyes otherwise <clears throat> they would see with their eyes hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and I would heal them there it is it's not that Jesus was trying to keep back from them his word it's that they their hearts had become dull by this time in his ministry they were following him for what they could get from him and not to obey him and give their lives to him that's the crux of the issue they wanted him to feed them they wanted physical healing that's understandable but Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost he came to give eternal life and that's what he was calling them to do but their hearts were not in the place where they were willing to respond to him and um, so again the the whole point of this is is that they would understand with their heart and return and I would heal them. Isaiah spoke this uh, to Judah at a time when their hearts had become dull. And Jesus is saying to his disciples right now, this prophecy which was fulfilled partially back in Isaiah's day is being fulfilled right now. Prophecy in the Old Testament can have a double fulfillment. It can even have a triple fulfillment because I will tell you that that what is being spoken of in this parable has continued to be fulfilled ever since Jesus gave this parable. It's being fulfilled right now among Christians and non-Christians, people who don't take the teaching of Jesus and the words of Scripture seriously. Loved ones, are you taking the Word of God seriously are you desperate for the Word of God are you hungry for the Word of God well that leads me to your notes section B um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to compare Matthew's account of this parable paragraph number one under letter B the first observation we see in verse 10 is that in dramatic contrast to the disciples the multitudes are nowhere to be found nowhere to be found this is the Messiah teaching them why did they not come and ask Jesus to explain the parable as the disciples did well paragraph number two moreover we must see that they asked Jesus why he spoke to the crowds in parables they meaning the disciples and they the disciples well understood the principle that parables were given to hide the truth from the casual seeker yet draw in the one who really had the heart to understand and obey that is extremely important I would encourage you if you have a, a pen or a, a highlighter to highlight that or underline that this is in 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 understanding the parables and in, in interpreting them it is critical to keep this in mind that parables back then everyone understood this everyone understood 
the point and the purpose of parables, that they were given to hide the truth from the casual seeker, but to draw in one and give the truth out to, who really had the heart to understand and obey. These, the crowds were condemning themselves. The heart of this people has become dull. That's why they walked away. Jesus is challenging them to hear and obey. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That was the challenge. He laid down the gauntlet, and they didn't pick it up. They just walked away and went back to whatever it was they were doing before they came to listen to him. Paragraph number three in your notes. Of course, the disciples would um, the disciples would understand why Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables in a short moment but only because Jesus explained his reason. Up to this point, he had spoken plainly, so why the sudden change, they wondered. That is, up to this point in, in his ministry, he had not spoken in parables. Now all of a sudden, he shifts into speaking in parables. Before that, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke plainly, nothing was hidden. But at this point in his ministry, now he speaks everything to them in parables, to the crowds, not to the disciples. Paragraph 4, nevertheless, we should not fail to see that our Lord enthusiastically commends his disciples for seeking the deeper truth behind the meaning of the parable. In parentheses, the word your in verse 16 is emphatic. It's emphatic. Let me read verse 16. But blessed are your eyes. That, that word comes first in the sentence in Greek. Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. Verse 17. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see. And, to, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. What is he referring to? He's referring to himself as the sower. He is the Messiah. He's teaching and preaching right in their very midst. How desperately the Old Testament prophets wanted to be able to see that day, but they didn't see it. But the, but these, the crowds were, were firsthand eyewitnesses. How tragic. How tragic. Paragraph number five, our Lord tells us precisely why the multitudes failed to come to him for further understanding in verses 11 through 15, which we've already read, an explanation that defines and reveals, watch this, the purpose for the parabolic teaching or for the teaching in the parables, as we've seen already in the introduction. Now, um, in Luo Koro, <laughs> paragraph number six in Luke 10, I mean, I'm sorry, in Luke 8, verse 10, you is emphatic over against the multitude. So the same account in Luke is, is also emphasized, Jesus is also um, emphasizing his disciples over against the multitudes. So let me read that again. In, in Luke 8, verse 10, you is emphatic over against the multitudes who by their failure to pursue the meaning of the parable also failed to heed our Lord's appeal to hear with a view to obeying. And as a result, this proved even more the words that follow about their condition. Now, I've already mentioned this before, but it's here in paragraph number seven. The Greek word translated mysteries in Matthew 13 verse 11 refers to something that was hidden but now is revealed however only to those who really want to follow the Lord recall George Ladd's explanation about the mysteries of the kingdom from the introduction this would be a good point for me to pause and just reinforce why it took a great deal of time uh, before I got into this parable to teach about the kingdom of God 
because all the parables relate to how the kingdom operates. Remember, what is, what is the kingdom of God? Do you remember what that is? Do you remember? I'm pausing because I'm hoping you all are, are answering the question out there in Siaya, Kenya, and those of you who are watching in San Jose or any, anywhere else in the world. Remember, the kingdom of God is the reign of God. It's the rule of God. In this age, it's spiritual. In the age to come, uh, in the millennium, and in the age to come, it will be spiritual and natural. Well, that leads me to paragraph number 8 in your notes. At first glance, Jesus' teaching in verse 12 might appear harsh if, if we forget the historical context that we've just discussed and if we don't take a careful look at verse 13. So what I'm really, what I'm teaching you again and what I want to take advantage of again is to reinforce and to reemphasize the three critical um, uh, matters involved in interpreting scripture and interpreting scripture accurately and soundly. What are they? Do you remember what those things are? The three things that are absolutely essential if you want to interpret Scripture accurately. Do you remember what they are? We have to understand the historical context. Remember, the New Testament was written 2,000 years ago to a culture completely different than ours. We have to understand the historical context. Then we have to understand the cultural context. These are Jewish people. I'm an American. Um, many of you also are Americans, and many of you are Kenyans. We're not, we're not from the Bible times. So we have to understand the cultural context, and we have to understand the literary context. That is the, uh, the verse that we're looking, in, looking at within the context of which it was written. And I've just given you that example. I mentioned verses 12 and 13. So let's read those uh, right now. Matthew 13, verses 12 and 13. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. 30, 60, 100 fold. And he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Is it God that's taking it away? No, it's not. It's a Hebrew figure of speech, a Hebraism, H-E-B-R-A-I-S-M, a, a, a Hebrew figure of speech, which means that if you don't cause what's valuable to grow, if you're not causing what's valuable to grow, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. And we haven't even gotten into the explanation yet, have we? And that's why he says in verse 13, therefore, therefore also is, a, is a, an important indicator in principles of Bible study, that word therefore is also a word of explanation. Therefore, because, or for, uh, or in order that, those are all what we call connectives. That is, it connects the previous verses with the, with the present verse and beyond. It's like what we used to learn in seminary. It's like a red flag word. A red flag word is basically saying, hey, wait a minute, stop. Take notice of this because it's an indication that what's to follow is very important. So again, every single time you see the word therefore, uh, uh, for, because, in order that, so that, explanation is following. So he says, he's explaining to them, remember, a context He's explaining to them, he's giving them an answer to their question in verse 10. Why do you speak to them in parables? And, and everything else that he says is basically the explanation. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables. Because while seeing, they are watching me. They, I live in Capernaum is what Jesus is saying. I'm accessible. They know where I live. I'm out there preaching and teaching and, and casting out demons and, and uh, feeding the multitudes and healing their bodies. They see me every day. They see the authority that I have. 
They hear my words, but now I'm calling them to follow me. And, and where their hearts at can be seen in the fact that they don't respond to, to the parable. He says, because while seeing, verse 13, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. We're going to translate that word understand in just a moment. Well, that brings me back to your notes in paragraph number nine. On the other hand, we should not miss God's goodness revealed in Jesus' benevolent desire to bless and reward with his promise of abundance. Now watch this in verse 12. For whoever has, to him shall more be given, and he will have an abundance. Loved ones, that, that's a clear indication of the heart of God for everyone. He's not unfair. He's not playing hard to get. He's not playing games. The same word of God goes out to everyone, and everyone can experience that 30, 60, 100-fold growth. But remember one of the principles of the kingdom of God. God will not force people to enter into his kingdom, and he will not force people to obey them, to obey him. That's one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to us, and that is free will. We're not robots pre-programmed to obey everything that, that, that God calls us to do. We're not computers that, that are pre-programmed to obey when I hit the letter Y key um, that the y, there, there should be a Y that comes up, correct? We're not laptops. We're not, we're not robots. Paragraph number 10 in your notes. In dramatic contrast, however, the phrase shall be taken away from him in verse 12 is a Hebrew figure of speech <clears throat> which simply means that he will lose or forfeit through his own neglect. That's that blank there. Through his own neglect the valuable teaching that he heard. For those pastors and leaders in Kenya, do you want your church to grow in strength and power, in quality? Then emphasize the sound teaching of the Word of God. Don't just give them a scripture on a Sunday morning teach them through scripture and teach them to study scripture themselves exhort them to to prepare their hearts to receive the word of god pray for them and yourself before you ever step up to teach and to preach his word will god bless your praying for the people and for yourself paragraph number 11 in your notes this is the nature of the great value of the word of god as well as a simple principle of how the kingdom of heaven operates through what has been called the law of use or the principle of use. That is, in every area of life, the more we exercise um, a gift or a talent, the better we become. Now, I wish I could paint um, but I, I, you know, you know, and I know that the one, the more one paints, the better one becomes, generally speaking, of painting. The one who practices soccer more and more, generally speaking, becomes a better soccer player, or I think you call it football in Kenya. Uh, the more one drinks in the Word of God, the, the stronger one becomes. The more one learns to pray and practices prayer, the stronger your prayer life. But if you don't pray, eventually it's going to be tough to pray. If you don't read the Word of God, eventually it becomes tougher to read the Word of God. If you, if you don't, if you're a football player and you're not out there practicing and you're not practicing for a year and then you go out the next day, 
your skills are not the same. There's a principle of using to grow, practicing to grow. Secondly, in paragraph number 12 of your notes, note carefully that Jesus describes in verse 13 precisely the willful neglect of the hearers, seen again in their failure to even ask for an explanation of the parable. Paragraph 13, this is seen most especially with the meaning of the Greek word translated understand. Now in parentheses you can see that um, this is just one of six Greek words translated understand or know. This is an interesting one. It refers to one who wisely discriminates and evaluates a matter to gain an insight as a result of putting various facts together. That is, what Jesus is referring to with this, with this Greek word understand, it's pronounced suniemi. It means that the hearer is responsible to take everything that he's heard and know it, understand it, and live it out. That leads me to paragraph 14. The word is, and again it's pronounced, suniemi, suniemi, suniemi. And it becomes the key verse from this passage. And, watch this now, it is repeated five times in this parable. Verses 13, 14, 15, 19, and 23. Now we've learned from principles of Bible study that the more you see a key word repeated, wow, that is something that we need to really lean into and heed and obey and, and make use of. Now, paragraph 15, by way of application to our lives, how we become spiritually fruitful and walk in the destiny that God has for us, listen, watch this, beloved, depends greatly in how we hear God's word. And, and I'm going to move from here to here. H-E-A-R. Because you hear the word of God with your heart, with your spirit. And how we make ourselves available to hear God's word. Almost on a daily basis, before I go to sleep at night, one of my prayers is, Father, um, prepare my heart to wake up tomorrow morning hungry and thirsty for your word. Now, is that a prayer that God wants to answer? I might pray that in the morning as well. I always pray before I open up the word of God. It's my own rule. Before I ever open the word, I always ask the Holy Spirit to lead me, guide me, change me, and transform me. And to help me to understand. And I add, help me to hear with faith. Because if I don't hear with faith, Hebrews 3 and 4 t teaches me that it's not going to profit me anything. I just think that that is a vital prayer to pray. But again, is it a prayer that God wants to answer? We know that it is a prayer that he wants to answer. Well, that leads me to paragraph number 16. In verses 14 and 15, we're in Matthew 13, it is, it's very important for us to recognize that Jesus quotes a passage from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, and then there are, um, there are words from Psalm 119, verse 70, and Zechariah 7, verse 11, mixed in with what he's quoting. Accordingly, we must consider the historical context of what Jesus quotes, of what Jesus quotes.